So, okay, good evening. Um, welcome to the public lecture organized by the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, IMS, um, at the National University of Singapore. This uh, public lecture series is uh, uh, sponsored by the Nikon Bank Memorial Fund. And uh, we organize a public lecture once a week, uh, on average, I think, two months. Yeah. And this evening's uh, public lecture is uh, to be given by Dr. Yuval Perez, who graduated from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1990 uh, in Israel, and uh, who then uh, took on faculty position at both Hebrew University and subsequently at the uh, University of California in Berkeley. But uh, in 2006, Dr. Perez moved to join Microsoft Research in Redmond, in the state of Washington. He is currently uh, a senior researcher or investigator in the uh, machine learning and optimization group of uh, Microsoft Research. Dr. Perez has uh, a wonderful international reputation as a scholar and scientist. He has won I don't know how many awards. In 1995, he won the Davidson Award in Prize, I think it's called. In 2001, he won the. Oh, uh, sorry, what's the prize? In 2001, it was the Nobel Prize. That's right, the Nobel Prize. And then in 2011, he won the Robbins Prize. Yeah, that's the one I forgot. And. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, a fellow of the Institute for Mathematical Statistics, and also very recently he was uh, elected as a foreign associate of the uh, United States National Academy of Science. So it's a very distinguished career. He has published um, uh, more than 300 papers and, and um, also written a book, and uh, was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in the year 2002. He has produced 22 PhD students, and one of our colleagues was uh, among this uh, list of uh, 22 PhD students. And this evening, he is uh, giving a public lecture. The title is uh, <coughs> Visual Mathematics uh, from Fair Division to well, uh, Cellular Automata. Uh, please welcome Dr. Perez. Good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for thank you for coming. Um, most of the talk today will be on um, you know, examples of visual mathematics from pure math. But um, since I am at Microsoft, let me uh, tell you one um, applied problem, which is uh, finding sparse cuts in a graph where the technique came from. A, a pure math problem on understanding mixing of Markov chains. So, so what is the applied problem um, here? So, okay. So this uh, was joint uh, work with Reid Anderson, who was at uh, Microsoft, and as well. And the kind of problem we have concerns uh, various big graphs, and these numbers are all uh, you know not fully up to date on um, so the web hyperlink graph, query click graphs, advertising keyword graphs, and the, the smallest one of these is the US road networks. And in all these graphs, what the uh, uh, what we want to do is to find the community of a node. Now the graph which will be easiest to visualize is not any of these uh, practical graphs, but the following random geometric graph, where we just throw down nodes at random in a square and connect any two whose distance is below some threshold r. So this is a random or delta. So this is uh, this random geometric graph. And uh, again, the goal will be to find the community of a single node, and that's something that gets used uh, in many applications when you want to uh, 
<laughs> as uh, we do at Microsoft and people do at Google to uh, you know, store the image of the web on a small number of computers, you still have to uh, decide how to partition it between those computers and you want to partition it in such a way that the, most of the links are uh, happening within one, the RAM of one computer rather than um, from one to the other. So this is an example of a graph partitioning problem. And another one close, closer to what I'll discuss is local graph partitioning. We have a single node of interest, maybe a single website, and we want to find a community of that node um, which uh, has a lot of interconnections and relatively few connections to the outside. So think of a network of 100 billion nodes, we have a single one, and we want to find a community of maybe 5,000 nodes around that. And we want the work we do to be related more to the 5,000 than to the 100 billion. So that's the kind of challenge of local partitioning. And here are, um, so it's a targeted version of the sparse cut problem. So here are some, you know, in the road network, you can kind of geometrically find good cuts. But, a, you know, the bigger network is like, query, is the advertiser and keyword network where we connect an advertiser to a keyword if that advertiser made a bid on uh, you know, advertising with that keyword. And, and there are many applications to this kind of uh, local partitioning problem. Um, and it's also used as a subroutine for other partitioning algorithms. So, so I won't go much more into the theory, but instead just show you uh, how the evolving set algorithm works for this problem. So um, let me go to that slide. Okay. Um, so here we go. So again, we're going to illustrate this with this random geometric graph. So given the starting node. Let me start the process again. So this evolving, uh, so what, the first naive way if we want to build a community of a node, or think of community of the friends of a you know, node on Facebook or a person on Facebook. So the first naive thing you do, well, let's look at the first order friends, then second order friends, then third order friends, and this will, uh, this is what's called breadth first search, and will very quickly cover the whole <coughs> network, but it is, too crude, it doesn't distinguish beyond the first order friends. When we go to second order, there are many different kinds of second order friends, right? Some are richly connected to the central individual via many connections and other, others uh, much less so. So, uh, so when we, find, we want to find a real community, we don't want just to do this crude breadth first search. And what this algorithm does is, it is, you can think of it as a smarter version of breadth first search. And uh, again, this algorithm was developed for another purpose in joint work with uh, Ben Morris back in 2003, and it's related, closely related to um, older work of Diaconis and Phil from 1990. And so how does this process grow? Given a starting node, uh, for each of its neighbors, we think, are we going to add it to the cluster or not? The probability we'll add it is just the fraction of the neighbors of the node in the current cluster. So as this cluster grows, every node enters with probability, which is its fraction in the current cluster. But as you see in this picture, this process we have here is not monotone. So for every node, we also have a chance to remove it from the cluster. And that probability also is according to it, the fraction of its nodes outside the cluster. So this cluster grows and shrinks. Um, and as it grows, it is really designed to capture good communities of the set. So if you let it run forever, this process, I mean, one thing I didn't add, it's conditioned not to disappear, so it will never actually shrink to a point. And after this conditioning, it has to absorb in the whole space. This will take a very long time. We don't want to wait that long. But as it, as in, in the process where it's, you know, growing and shrinking and uh, eventually growing, uh, it goes through sets that are very good communities of the initial node, namely they have relatively few edges to the outside compared to edges to the inside. And being able to 
visualize this on a random geometry graph is helpful in developing the algorithm. So, to this example, let me turn to examples more from really from pure math. And um, he's <coughs> so one of my goals would be to explain what you're seeing in this picture, which is the abelian sand pile. But let me start with a different one, which is the uh, okay, so and uh, let me start with a model called the rotor router. So this is a model uh, first developed by Prijev and colleagues under the name Prijev Dar and colleagues under the name Eulerian Walkers, and then by Jim Prop under the name uh, Rotor Router. So let's look what this model does. So this will be a growth model um, where we will add nodes in, at the center and or as particles at the center, I should say. And each time we do that, um, the particles will eventually spread out according to the arrow. So specifically the rule is um, when we add the particle, we add it always at the center, first rotate the arrow by 90 degrees, and then move according to the direction of the arrow. And if this location is unoccupied, the particle settles there. Again, we add a new particle at the origin. Okay, so we add the particle, rotate the arrow, move to an unoccupied spot, and stay there. Now the next particle, again, moves up here and settles there. Now the following particle will move to the right. That location is also occupied, so the arrow will rotate and will settle where in the next step, and so on. So now each time I'll press the button, We'll start one particle at the center and we'll just see its whole trip until it settles in an occupied spot. So this is called rotor router aggregation. And one question that Jim Prop asked back in 2003 is, well, what shape is this leading to? Can anyone guess? Circle. Okay, let's run it faster. And uh, indeed, it's a circle. So this, you know, Jim already knew the simulation, but um, you know he couldn't prove this is going to a circle, and this was um, something we did together with Lionel Levine uh, in around 2006. <laughs> and now, although we can prove that the limit shape is a circle, it is much more circular and much more perfect than the proofs. Are showing. So let me try and get uh, you know, a picture of how this looks. So, so this is the rotor router model with the million particles. Okay. So, um, the colors are the directions of the arrow, right? Exactly. So the, each node is colored by the direction of the arrow. And uh, you see there's a pattern uh, of the colors. But first I want to dwell on the circularity. So in, so in 2003, Jim asked us to show that the ratio of the, you know, the in radius and the out radius of this shape goes to 1. So it does scale to a circle. Um, we, uh, we first showed some bounds on the error, but the bounds were uh, of the form, some power of the radius. Um, just in 2016, we improved the result to show that the fluctuations are at most logarithmic. So if we look at the radius, how it changes as we go around, it's at most log of the number of particles. But in fact, what the simulations indicate is that it's much, much rounder than current math can show. So if we look at the difference of the in radius and the out radius, so from the center to the closest point on the outside and to the furthest point, this difference never exceeds two in all our experiments. So it's basically as round as it could be given that it's a lattice, set on the lattice. Uh, and this is, again, beyond current technology to prove such a precise 
picture. Now one, I'll say a little more about the pattern inside, but uh, <laughs> that's one thing which there is a remarkable persistence of this uh, pattern. So what do you see in the shape here? This is what results when you start, instead of at a single center, you start at two different centers. And uh, put particles in both locations, and they're moving according to these uh, rotor rules. Maybe uh, we'll go back to the simulation to see that. And um, So, okay, so let's do, start with two centers. So, when we start with two centers, initially they form disks, but when these disks merge, we get this shape. Now here, if I fix the locations and let time grow, eventually this will become a disk. So the right thing to do is to time it just right to get the more interesting picture, and uh, basically stop it at the time which is this the square of the distance between the initial points. And then we get this uh, interesting picture, which it actually follows from um, results of Aharonov and others in complex analysis, that if we look at this shape, the boundary is a algebraic curve of degree 4. So you can write a formula for the boundary here, which is a polynomial in two variables of the fourth degree. And in general, if you start with k points, like with one point you get a circle, which is a quadratic polynomial. If you start with k points, it's known that you get a boundary which is described by a polynomial of degree 2k. So of course, you know it if the points are far, because if you want to write an equation for you know, k circles, you can write it as one equation of degree 2k. But the interesting thing is it's still true even if you start the points close and you get this kind of shape. So, um, so that's the rotor router, and uh, now the sh some of you have seen the shape that uh, was up before the lecture started, so let me get that simulation going again. Um, so this is a simulation due to Alexander Holroyd of uh, sand file, and let me start. So this is the relevant simulation. So um, maybe before going on with the simulation, I should show you something of what, what this process is. So this is the abelian sand pile, a model invented several times independently in statistics, statistical physics by Bakhteng and Weisenfeld, and then uh, developed much further by Deepak Dar, who's made, made it contributions to this model, and it was independently invented in combinatorics slightly later under the name of chip firing by Bjorn Robert and Shore. It has connections to many areas of mathematics, and I won't go into these here. Um, so what is the model? Um, let's think of it in two dimensions. So think of d equals 2 here, so every location in the lattice has four neighbors, and we start with some configuration of chips, or later we're going to add more chips or particles at the center, as you saw in the picture. And the rule is whenever a location has four or more chips, they uh, topple and one goes to every neighbor. So let's see this in an example. Um, so say we start with 16 particles at the center. So I said, when you have four or more, you send one to each neighbor. So this is the fair division that I was referring to. So fair division is, you know, is used more in economics, but here I'm focusing on math examples where the point is to divide very fairly between the neighbors. So each one of these, so we have one particle toppling to each neighbor. We still have 12 in the center, so we repeat. One particle goes to each neighbor and we get two in each neighbor, repeat again, topple, and repeat again. Now there's zero at the center, but there are four at each of these sites. So now they can topple as well, because they have enough to topple, so each of them topples. So, for instance, when this one topples, we get this picture, and we keep going and toppling these fours, and we create a new four in the center, which also needs to topple, 
And this configuration is called stable because there's no location with more than one, more than, than three particles. So this is what you see in this simulation, just run, uh, run faster. So again, this is this one. So here, instead of starting with a fixed number at the center, I keep dropping sand in the center, and, and then um, the toppling is the same as you saw before. And we start getting this shape. And naively, when we were looking at this shape, we thought, well, this should also go to a circle. But it turns out that it really doesn't. And this was realized before us, certainly by uh, by Dibandar and others. Here is a let's see. Um, okay, here is what it looks like with a million particles. So you have uh, so it's roughly a twelve-sided polygon, but not exactly. So you see there uh, there are some twelve flat sides, but between them there are some rounded shapes and. The, now, what, is the, what are, do the colors mean in this picture? Uh, the color represents how many chips are in each location. So it's either 0, 1, 2, or 3. The blues are threes, and so on. So you see a pattern, and the amazing thing is if you do this with 100,000 particles, with a million particles, or with a billion particles, the pattern looks the same. Even though the growth here is not growth by expansion, it's growth by this kind of toppling procedure. Um, now, um, initially we couldn't prove that there is a scaling limit for this picture. So for the rotor router we know there's a disk scaling limit and we understand what happens with different certain integration. Here this was a harder problem which was finally solved uh, in paper of 2013 by Pegden and Smart who showed that there is a scaling limit for the sand pipe uh, although that is a much harder fact, and identifying it is still not completely solved. There's uh, huge progress on that in work of Levine, Pegden, and Smart, but it's not solved to completely identify it. To understand this better, it's useful to look at other background conditions. So, suppose that, uh, let's, let's start, uh, go back to the simulation. And suppose that I change the background height. So in this picture, I kept adding sand at the center, and everywhere else was at height zero. So uh, we could change this background condition. So for instance, here I'm going to start with background condition of all two. So this means every location has initially two particles. So red stands for two here. And we keep adding particles at the center. Whenever a yellow indicates that we get a four, so a four will topple. And you see here the growing shape just looks like a square. And this, in this case, is possible to prove. First proved by Fay and Redding that we do get a square. But inside this square is a growing butterfly. And, uh, you know, so the work of Pegden and Smart and Levine starts to explain why we will get this butterfly at all different sizes, but exactly why we get this particular butterfly is still uh, not understood. Uh, one thing you can ask, so what, what happens with different boundary conditions? So I showed you zero and two, another natural uh, background condition is one. So again, every location has one particle to begin with. You still need four in order to topple. And in this case, it seems like you get uh, an approximately an octagon, but that's still not proved. Now, empirically, when you add more and more, when you increase the background height, you get something with fewer size. So I told you about background height of two. What about background height of three? Well, if you have background height of three, then it turns out that uh, you, if you have three everywhere and four at the center, then that's enough for the process to just topple forever without adding any more sand. So that's why you don't have background height of three. But 
there are all kinds of interesting initial background heights. So, for instance, this is background height of, uh, of three in these blocks, but with these red rows between them. And these are enough so that if you start with a fixed constant number at the center, this picture will eventually stabilize. In a very interesting pattern. On the other hand, in this skew lattice, so if we start here, you, then with a large enough initial configuration, we don't have to keep adding, if we just add a constant number of particles, this will already create infinite motion, that somehow there's enough wood here to create an infinite fire, even if we just add a small match at the center. So, in all in all of these cases, both for the rotor and the sand pile, the visualization has been driving force in the analysis, and I'll show you some more examples of that. Any questions? So, I'll show you one more example, which is actually the first of these kind of examples to be analyzed. What you see here is IDLA, internal diffusion limited aggregation um, invented by Witten and Sander and first analyzed by Lawler, Branson and Griffith. So what's going on here? The colors still indicate the direction of the arrows, but the difference from the rotor story I told you in the beginning is that here um, the particles leave a site instead of in a periodic fashion, in random fashion. So. Um, you start at the center and every particle moves to a random location, a random neighbor, until it finds uh, its unoccupied spot. And for this one, um, so that original paper showed that the shape is asymptotically singular, that was back in, in 1991. <laughs> the fluctuations were only understood uh, six, seven years ago, in independent work of both uh, Asela and Godinier and um, sorry, and of the Gerson, Levine and Sheffield um, that the fluctuations here are logarithmic in two dimensions and even smaller in higher dimensions but you see here that the, you can kind of see in this picture that the fluctuations are real. There really are these fluctuations of the boundary. It's not completely round in the random case. So the random case is completely analyzed. It's known due to the work of those authors that the fluctuations in two dimensions are indeed logarithmic. But for the rotor, we have the same upper bound. So the fluctuations are logarithmic, but there's no lower bound, and we suspect that there's more regularity to be found there. Um, so one thing about the color. So you see in IDLA, this is again the direction of the rotor, but it's completely random, so you see nothing. While in the rotor picture, we saw this nice pattern of the colors. So this pattern is not completely understood, but there is some understanding due to work of Ostojic, and let me get to that. So, okay, so what do you see here? So that this is the pattern uh, that we saw before from the rotor, but we apply to it the transformation. And maybe I'll go back to the, so the transformation is z goes to one over z squared. So that's kind of reflection in the circle and squaring. And this will map the strange pattern we saw before in the, in the inside the disk of the rotor router into something which looks like a lattice pattern. You can see that. And although the sand pile is defined in a very, you know, it doesn't lead to a circle, it looks somewhat different, but we have the same property as discovered by Stojits that when you apply this complex transformation, um, z goes to 1 over z squared, you get a lattice pattern. Although the colors here mean something completely different. Remember, in the rotor, the colors meant the direction of the arrow. 
In the sand pile, the colors mean the number of chips at every site. Yet the same map is playing a crucial role in, in both these examples. Uh, here is one more mystery discovered by Gar. Uh, so it's discovered but not yet understood. Um, relating a two and a three dimensional sand pile. So this is a critical three dimensional sand pile. We, uh, so the dimension is three. The background height is four. So every site initially has four particles. Uh, and we keep adding particles at the center. And we get, uh, well, we get some, uh, a growing cube. So, um, now in this cube, if you take five million particles, take this cube and examine it sliced through the center. So we slice through the center, we get a square, and we get this pattern inside the square. So this pattern of colors, and uh, again, the colors mean the number of chips. Now on the right, you have two dimensions, background height two, and this carefully chosen number of initial particles at the center, and you get this picture, which is different from the left one, only in some circle around the origin. So if I look outside this circle, then these two pictures turn out to be identical pixel by pixel. So it's not just that they look the same, they're exactly identical outside some neighborhood of the origin. So this kind of dimension reduction of this model is still, um, is still a bit mysterious. Um, I said there's a lot of progress on, so this model, the abelian sandpile, is more difficult than the rotor router. A lot of progress on it in recent years due to uh, Begden, Smart, Levine, and others. So, <laughs> and the last two examples I want to turn to involve fair division in a different sense. And um, let me show this and get to those. So, so, again, a case where visualization was a driver of the mathematical analysis. So, this is a picture drawn by Andrew Holroyd, and uh, the relevant work is uh, by Holroyd, uh, Chris Hoffman, and myself. And uh, so, what do you see here? So, there's a bunch of centers. And the goal is, so this, we have a pic, uh, we have a square, it's actually a torus, so the square with periodic boundary, the left side and the right side are identified, up and bottom, mm -hmm. top and bottom are identified. So we have this, uh, this square, and we drop some 300 points at random in the square, so these are these centers you see here. The goal is to divide the square into territories, where every center gets the same area. But the centers are given to you. They're picked at random and now they're given. How do you divide without kind of central control in, in a kind of distributed manner the square into equal size territory? So this is one method, the, and it's called the stable allocation. And one way to think about it is for every center you grow a disk at unit speed, and the center captures all the area it reaches first until it gets its quota, then it stops growing. So some centers are lucky, like this one, it will get it all its area locally. But some centers are hemmed in, and they have to find their area far. So, uh, so if you look, so anything which is big here, like this, if you look at this, it's part of the territory of this center. So this center grows a disk, but it's so surrounded that it only captures very little area near the center. But the disk keeps growing in the background until it comes up for air, uh, you know, much further when these are sated and it completes the territory. So these territories are actually disconnected, but every center does get its fair share of area. So, Um, 
So, so, so some of the later work on this was also joined with Robin Dimantel and Jose Trump. And, um, and again, so the kind of problem this addresses, and this will connect also to tomorrow's colloquium, I'll explain at the end. So again, the kind of problem is we have a random center, so if it's in this square, these are just uniform random points. If you're in the whole plane, it's natural to think of a Poisson process, just the limit of uniform points. And uh, now the procedure I told you about, it grows a stable allocation. So it's not just a fair allocation, it's a stable allocation. What does that mean? So um, here is a center C and the point X. This, this partition would be unstable in the sense that C and X, X is not in the territory of C, but it's closer to C than, uh, than to its center. And conversely, C has some points that are further than X. So C and X would prefer to match up than to uh, have their current allocation. And this notion of stability comes from the work of Gale and Shapley. Um, so Gale and Shapley in the uh, 1962 wrote an influential paper. It eventually led to a Nobel Prize for Shapley uh, and Roth, uh, since Gale uh, passed away before the prize was awarded. So they were considering more applied problems of matching um, students to colleges, or uh, you know, they gave the illustration of matching uh, men to women as a stable marriage, where a, an unstable matching is a situation where a pair prefer each other to their assigned matches. And they showed that you always have a stable matching without any unstable pair. And they provided an algorithm to find that matching, and that algorithm or variants of it are used today in many applications, including uh, assigning schools in uh, children to schools in the public schools of New York City and residents to hospitals in many locations and so on. So that algorithm can be used to realize the process I described to you before. So I told you a process where the balls are growing continuously, but to, to prove things about that process, this continuous growth is not convenient because there's too much dependence. Um, so it's better to have a discrete procedure, and it turns out you can um, implement... So this is, again, the, the Gay Shapley story between, say, men and women, or colleges and students. And we can it imitate their algorithm in the in this geometric setting and I won't go through it in detail but this is the stage one applications every center applies so I guess here it's every student applies to the closest center so this, what are the students? the students are the points in the plane and these are the centers and what you get is known as the Voronoi oscillation if we have centers and we just partition uh, according to which point each point goes to its closest center you get this this process this partition so this is a very nice partition but the areas are not equal and by iterating the steps of the um, get the algorithm you can convert to the same picture that I showed you in the beginning. In the beginning. So, okay, let me stop with this example. And one, one thing that was less ideal in this partition is that the territories are disconnected. And, uh, Maxim Kun came up with a nice way to get connected territories. This is his picture of that way. And it's based on drawing a spanning tree in the plane and applying conformal mapping. I won't get into the exact story, uh, but it was very hard to analyze this. Although the shapes are connected, to understand their sizes, 
uh, is still not known. And the kind of later twist on this is the method of gravitational allocation, which I will be talking about tomorrow in the colloquium, but I'll just give you a little example today. So, for, for motivation, so, uh, so that's in the joint work with Holden and Jai based on a lot of earlier work and it's again related to matching. So this is the picture you saw before and the kind of partition you get here is really much nicer. So this is a pair partition into, um, again, so in this case it's happening on the sphere, not the torus, but you could do the same on the torus. And the basic method here is that is that sorry? Is that every every center applies a force of gravity, two-dimensional gravity, to uh, the points of the sphere, and every point moves according to this gravity, using that as a gradient flow, and yields this partition. So again, there's a lot of relevant history for this method, which I will uh, discuss tomorrow in the colloquium. Uh, but this method does yield equal areas and turns out to be also more efficient than the other one in terms of the distance traveled from a typical point in the territory to the center. There are still many open problems to understand this, uh, this method. Well, so I'll get to that tomorrow. Um, any questions about any of this? Okay, so the final example I wanted to tell you is a, it's a public lecture. So this is some um, an amusing story involving a hundred year old problem on piling blocks and most of the work here was done by Mike Patterson and Uri Zwick, but uh, then uh, part of it was uh, it was completed in joint work where uh, Michael Thor, Peter Winkler, and myself joined them. So, last topic that I want to tell you about, and uh, very classical, the overhang problem. So. Slideshow. Dangerous. Okay, so what is the problem? We have a table and some bricks, and the goal is to get the bricks to hang as far as possible from the edge of the table. So, simple optimization problem, we have n bricks, how far can they go? So, what's the classical solution? Suppose I have two bricks, or maybe suppose I have one brick, then I can of course slide it until it just reaches half its length is hanging over the table. If I slide it anymore, it will fall. So, what about two bricks on the table? So. The top one can still go to distance half, but the one before, um, you know, it can only go to distance one quarter. If I move it any more, then this pair will fall down. And you can just iterate and see that the optimal solution of this type, where you just uh, do greedy local optimization each time adding one more brick, is just half the harmonic series. So when I add n bricks, I can get to distance 1 over 2 n, and if I'm forced to just put one brick at every layer, that's as far as it can get. And this goes back like a hundred years. And this example you can find in many uh, old physics book and books and uh, riddle books. Okay, but is this really the best? So these are harmonic stacks. So it's certainly not optimal. So here is an example with three bricks. Already with three bricks, this configuration does better. Okay, so 
Um, so it will go to distance one, while this one went to 11 over 12. So, so the optimal, the classical solution is not optimal. Um, and there's this otherwise nice book, Mad About Physics, that explains the classical solution and then suggests creating this kind of wall and claims that this will be stable. Um, and they actually, more precisely, they suggest to put two of these to create a, a diamond. And indeed, the four diamond is balanced. So this is this kind of picture is, is balanced. There are questions? However, it turns out that the five diamond is unbalanced. And rather than showing the equations, here's a movie. Really, <laughs> so analyzing this involves really writing down the forces and doing some classical statics. And what Patterson and Zwick found is that you can get. So I'm going to the example, and they found that parabolic constructions of this nature will be stable. So basically you think of a parabola and fill it with cubes, and then they do the statics to show that this is stable. So how far does this go? You know, in a parabola, the number of cubes you get up to distance d will be total d cubed because you're filling the inside of the parabola. So so if it's order d cubed, so this is the exact number, um, order d cubed to get overhang about d, what this means is that if I have in my hand n blocks, I will be able to get to cube root of n. So this is the Patterson's width result. And what, okay, so you can get to order cube root of n with n blocks. Remember, the, this contrasts with the classical solution, which was only half log n. So really, you can do much better, um, and this is something that does slightly better, the oil lamp configuration, um, because, you know, we want to get far this way, we don't care so much about this, so this we just use for balance, so, and this is uh, an exact picture with overhang 10, and um, one thing which was left open by Patterson and Zwick is is cube root of n the best you can do? Because they had such a great improvement from log n to cube root n, and then they tried many, many patterns, and they could just get different constants times cube root of n, and that's where the rest of the co-authors joined in the second paper uh, to show that, so to show that indeed cube root of n is the optimal. And I'm going to finish with this and just say that the solution turned out to be based on some a random walk type problem or splitting game. So what is the splitting game? You have a unit of mass at the origin. So it's a different problem. It turns out that because of the statics equations for the forces, this problem is very closely related to this overhang problem. So what's this other problem? You know, we're starting fresh. You have a unit of mass, and the goal is to send a constant fraction of the mass, say half the mass, to distance n. So at each step, what you can do is split the mass, point to a vertex, and split the mass there equally between the neighbors. So the splitting corresponds to what the forces are doing in the overhang problem. So, but you can think of this problem separately from the overhang problem. You have a unit of mass. Your goal is to get half of it distance n, and each move you choose a location and you split. So you see now, so here, one is chosen and the mass is split, so half goes to zero, half goes to two. Uh, now, minus one is chosen and the mass is split, and again, we get this picture and so on. And so each time you can only choose one location and split the mass there between the neighbors. And the question is, how many such uh, steps are needed to get to distance here? And it turns out that's the same as asking, so 
clear reduction, but how many blocks are needed to get to distance n in the overhead problem. So if I am in a splitting problem, how much do I need to get to distance n? So here random walk can guide us. So if I look at random walk on an interval of from minus n to n, if I want to the random walk to go with probability half outside the interval, I should run the random walk for time which is about n squared. So that's it. Easy factor one there. Now the splitting gain is close to random walk, but not the same because in the random walk, really at every time I'm splitting the distribution at all locations. Wherever the particle is, its, it's distribution in the next step will split from the current distribution. Um, so one step of the random walk kind of corresponds to n steps of the splitting process. And this really suggests that for the splitting process you need n cubed moves to get half the mass to distance a. And However, the splitting game is, has much more freedom than the random walk because we're allowing to do any pattern, any algorithm of choosing one site at a time and splitting the mass there. So we have to give a different proof that indeed n cubed moves are needed and that eventually you know, led to showing that cube root of n is the maximum distance you can get in the overhang problem. So these papers can all be found in the Math Monthly from, in, from 10 years ago, uh, but um, is there a question? Okay, so uh, let, me, uh, let me end here and, and have to answer any questions.